Thank you, Carly. Uh, great um, introduction right there. <laughs> Appreciate that. And that video, I mean, obviously I have great hype people. John, <laughs> he helped me put that together. But I just want to say thank you to uh, the committee for getting me here and allowing me to come have this honor. This is a, this is a very special day for me. Uh, it's been far too long since I've been back in Tampa Bay. And uh, I have so much love for this place and some of the people in this room that I've known for a long, long time. It's been uh, an incredible journey for me to be able to be back here um, at this time. You know, God has been very good to me. I, I love what this whole event is centered around. I mean, 50 plus years that uh, the Lord has blessed this event and brought people into this, uh, these types of spaces. And um, I have to say also a special thank you, not only to Keith and the committee, but also to the, the service members. Again, I, we can't recognize you guys enough, the officers, the service members uh, of the community here and what y'all do on a daily basis, putting yourselves on the line, the real heroes among us, absolutely. Um, and I just feel so much gratitude right now that I get this opportunity to speak to you guys. You know, not, not everybody gets the opportunities that I've had in my life to play a game that I love, to do something that a kid gets to do for a long, long time. Uh, but then on top of that, to get a chance to learn from it, have some time to think through it, go back, you know, to be able to be retired for a few years and kind of go, okay, God, what did you just do in my life for the last 20 years? Not a lot of people get that opportunity. I mean, I mean I'm 42 years old now. And for those of you that are in that range of, you know, 30 to 50 or whatever, you know that there's like a, a midlife point in there where you start going, okay, half, I'm halfway over here before my time is done. And I've had some opportunities then the last few years to really think through that and really dive into what, what is my real purpose? What am I really called to? Now, I know so many of you are baseball fans in this room. Uh, can, I, can I get a round of applause for the baseball fans here? I know there's some Tampa Bay fans. Thank you. Let's get a win today, boys, right? Yesterday wasn't so good, but that's all right. Today is a new day. That's what we would always say. We got it. Let's come back and do it. Uh, a strong, I have to share at least one Tampa Bay Rays story, okay? A strong story. 08 was a special year, right? 2008, for those of you that are Rays fans, was the first year Tampa Bay ever went to the World Series. And I remember my vantage point. I was a part of that team. I was up and down all year long. Finally stuck with the team in August for, through the rest of the year. Had some really unique moments that I got to be a part of towards the end of the year. And then I'm on the playoff roster. You know, Joe Madden, Andrew Friedman, the front office here had such a vision for what this team could be. And they wanted me to be the first ever kind of utility guy that like played on a regular basis. So I got a chance to be a part of that team. And I'll never forget being on the bench for that last game with Boston. You guys remember it, where I think they just, you know, in, in, in bronze, uh, maybe Akinori or something outside the stadium with his hands up at that moment when that out took place. It was a ground ball to second base. I think it was off of Jed Lowry's bat. Aki fields it, goes to step on the bag, and that's the final out. And we went into pandemonium, right, as a team. I I'll never forget being on the bench in that moment. For those of you that were big fans, you know where you were when you were watching that moment. And we're jumping out onto the field. Incredible moment. And when you think about the competition, just competition in general brings out some of the, the biggest emotions that we can potentially ever have, right? That's why we love sports in general. And as a player, yes, you're on the field, you're feeling all those, all those things, but you got to compete and perform. And so you can't be feeling all those emotions all game long. You've got to like hold it all in. Well, in that moment, there's so much anticipation. Okay, this is it. We're finally going to go to the World Series. And for those of, the, of us that had never experienced it, you know, we're just waiting for that moment. There's so much anticipation. And when it finally happens, the elation of that moment is something like I've never experienced before. We're, we're running out onto the field. 
We're going crazy. We're about to pile on to David Ross and Aki and all those guys that are coming into the, the mound at that moment. And I'll never forget like running, sprinting, like Johnny Gomes next to me and some of these guys like we're just, ah, you know, going crazy. And then we get into the pile and we jump in and, and there was this, this loud scream of, ah, yeah. And then like all of a sudden it's like, ah. <laughs> the compression of body upon body of professional athletes and you're under the pile is not a good feeling. I got to be honest. For a moment there, I wondered if my life would be over and it was scary, right? But there was something about that moment that was so amazing and beautiful. And we went to the World Series and we won't talk about that after that, right? Because it wasn't really great after that. But, but that moment was a very special moment that I have in Tampa Bay history. And so many other moments that are more personal in nature with my children. One of my daughters was born in St. Petersburg and uh, I've lived all over. We were talking about where, places I've lived in the area. I've lived all over this area at different times during my career. And the majority of my career was spent in Tampa Bay. And people might know me a little bit more now, and Cubs Nation might know me a little bit more now as what I did in the World Series, what you guys watched on the, on the video. But most of my personal memories are here, right? And this is a very special place to me. When I look back at the World Series in 2016 and the defining moment for me as an athlete, getting a huge hit in a clutch moment and all the pressure that went into all of that, uh, you know, trying to be a hero on a daily basis with my teammates. I got to the mountaintop of mountaintops, right? Like I, I got to go to the World Series in Tampa Bay and then I, got, I went to Kansas City and I won a World Series in Kansas City. It was a part of that amazing run. And then I go to Chicago. It's like, well, if you win a World Series in Kansas City, and I, I knew I had a couple more years of my career. It's like, where do I go to, to win the most ultimate World Series? Well, there, there's never been one, one in Chicago in 108 years. So I was like, that's where I go to do it. We go to Chicago. Joe Madden, my old manager from here, is in Chicago at that point. So he recruited me over there. He's like, you got to come join what we're doing. And we do it in the first year, right? And all the pressure that went behind that, right? Because we're, we know what's going on. We know that it's 108 years. We know it's game seven. But you're blocking all that and all the pressure that, that goes into that. And when that happened, I did not expect to be at the center of it all. I was, I really enjoyed my position, my role as a good role player on the team. I liked letting Evan Longoria lead the way. I liked letting Chris Bryant and, and Anthony Rizzo and Javi Baez and, and John Lester and those guys like lead the way. I was good just as long as I'm doing my job well and I want to be a part of the World Series championship team. But that, I had a good World Series. And, and I got the hit. And the only reason why I got the hit, and Rizzo would remind me of this, is because they walked our best hitter, Rizzo, to get to me. Okay? Don't get me, uh, don't get me wrong. I know. Like, I mean, look, I slapped it down the left field line, right? It's not like a home run or anything. I knew my place, but then God put me in that position of power and influence of being the MVP, something I never expected to be. Didn't actually really even want because I... I knew that there would be a lot that would come with that. And boy, did it really pile on me at that moment. And boy, did I really feel the compression of that moment. There's something amazing about the expansion of your world when you become an MVP or something like that, where like all of a sudden the whole world is at your fingertips. And you're on the mountaintop and you're like, you're surveying the land and going, wow, look at the amount of kingdom I could have now influence I could have now. But what comes with something like that is also all the extra, right? With the expansion of this new space is all the pressure of people's expectations. And I felt that like never before after the World Series in 2016. So much so that within two to three weeks, I mean, I had 5,000 requests after the World Series to come and speak and do things like this and, and be on interviews. And I went to Jimmy Fallon show and Conan O'Brien and Disney World on a private jet. And, and so many cool things were at my fingertips. 
And yet I had to say no to way more. And that did something to me. I was like, I can't, like I wanted to meet everybody's needs. I wanted to, to be there for everybody. I wanted to, to go share Jesus with everybody and, and use the platform that I had been given. And yet I had nothing left of myself. I didn't know how empty I really was inside until two or three weeks later, I started having trouble sleeping. I'm like, what's going on with me? Just normal, basic life things I was struggling with, uh, just taking my kids to school, carpool lane, sick kids, just in, you know, trying to start my workouts again after three or four weeks off. I just was really struggling. I didn't know what was going on. But what I realize now as I look back is I was starting to experience something, some clinical depressive symptoms. I wouldn't have said, oh, I'm depressed. And I, I wouldn't have said that at the time, but I didn't know that mental health was something that I was really struggling with. You know, now, especially after COVID, we're starting to talk about it a lot more and we need to, right? There, there's, there's a lot of struggles with that, but while success is like exhilarating and ex expansive in so many ways, it's also very expensive and costly. And I didn't realize what that success was costing me internally because externally I had all, all that I needed and more for, for years to come. And yet internally I was feeling like I was dying inside. It's not the way people look. There's so many people that can put on a front for a while, right? And I could do it for a long time. It doesn't mean that I didn't have a relationship with Jesus either. It didn't mean that I, I didn't know God. But it did mean that there were some things that I was completely unaware of that I was struggling with. That I had, it was, there was long time for me to address. And all the pressure and the compression of that moment made it come out. You know, I, I, at that point, it was like, what am I supposed to do? Well, I didn't know what to do. So I struggled with it for a couple months, got into spring training. And the only reason why I didn't take medication at the time is because I, I had to play baseball. I'm like, we, we get tested all the time for any sort of anything you put in your body. And I didn't want to go to the Cubs and be like, hey, I need to take this medication. But ultimately, I was scared. There was so much fear that I had in my life in that moment. But I couldn't talk about it. I didn't know what to say. God woke me up one morning in spring training. As I, I was even in this moment in my life, oddly enough, I was having suicidal ideation. And I was like, I didn't, I was like, I should be the happiest person in, in the world after what I experienced. But that's not how it works. When you're in pain internally, your brain comes up with ways to try to get out of it. And it's really not abnormal. So many people struggle with it. So if you feel like you're alone and you might be struggling with something right now, you're not alone. So many people, it's very normal for to be, if you're in such pain, for your mind to try to come up with ways. I still think it's a broken solution. It's never a solution. But it's what, it's what happens. And I wanted to take those thoughts captive as a Christian and be like, this is not me. This isn't real. I don't know what's going on with me. So I was fighting that internal battle. And I remember praying to the Lord so much, like, Lord, what, what is going on? He woke me up one morning with the word enough, enough, enough. And I didn't really understand that. I didn't understand. And I'm going to get back to that in a minute. But relationship 101 with God, he says in the scripture, he says, the, the greatest commandment is this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I'm like, what does that even mean? Uh, there's four different parts of us that he's talking about there that I'm like confused what are all those things? Because I love to me is like, there's one thing, you either love it or you don't. I love baseball. You know, I don't love traffic. I mean, there's just, it's very simple in a lot of ways, but it is far more complex than that because there are different parts of us. And, and while I think, especially as a man and as an athlete, I learned early on to love, to love the game with my body. 
to go work hard, get my body in shape, get it ready to do what I can do. I learned to love the game with my mind. I knew how to strategize and think through the game and make good decisions in the game. You learn that early on. I think most of us, especially as, as men, we learn early on that, hey, if I, don't, if I don't think well and do the right things with my body, guess what? I'm not going to perform well. It's a hard and fast rule in sports. But what does it mean to love God with your heart and your soul? I was like, what does that even mean? As an athlete, emotions are something that you block out a lot of times because emotions don't help you so many times in the game. They either get you off your game or they, they just are distracting, they get in the way. So I learned to block emotions early on. That was the way that I was supposed to deal with emotions as a, as a young athlete. You know, just avoid them. And soul, I was like, well, soul, it sounds more like the spiritual nature. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I know how to, I know God. I know what a relationship with God looks like. Well, you read your Bible, you pray, you go to church, you, you try to do the right things. Like it, it just seemed like, oh, well, this is how you love God and you love with your soul. It's far more than that. In the last few years, I've come to understand a little bit more of what it means to love God with my heart, love God with my soul, with the unique way that he's made me. See, I see the soul as each individual in here has a unique personality, a unique experience. You are so gifted and so purposeful in the way that God made you and the, the things that he is allowing you to go through. And as a baseball player, I knew who I was as a ball player. I knew my identity out on the field, especially late in my career. I'm like, I know what I'm good at and what I'm not good at. I knew who I was out there, but I didn't know who God made me to be in just in life in general. And that I had to do some real soul digging. And in order to, to do some soul digging to really figure out who you are outside of the role, you have to have some space, some margins, some, some solitude, some quiet. And I didn't have very much quiet in my life. Lord knows most of us don't have much quiet in our lives, especially if you have kids. Right? You got things to do. You got to either go to work and get the job done there. Or you got to come home and get the job done there. There's not much space until you make it. Well, God has given me the unique ability the last couple of years to, to have a little bit more margin, quite a bit more margin, more than I even wanted. And I've had to look deep within to figure out what does my relationship with God look like in my heart and my soul? Back to the baseball story, the word enough. Why is it that it seems like in performing, whether it's your job, sports, like even dad duties or whatever duties you have, why does it seem like it's never enough? Because in a way, the need is always there. There's always a need to be better and do more. There's way more need than there is time we have to meet those needs, right? Performance-based acceptance is something that I've always struggled with. And I, I think a lot of us have, especially you grow up, you learn like, hey, this is how you need to do things to be a good quality citizen. This is how you need to do things to get the grade in school. This is how you need to do things to do well on the field or do, to, to perform well, to get the, the, the paycheck at the end of the day. Performance-based acceptance is always quantitative in nature. You know, there's, there's only a certain amount uh, of money to go around and there's a job to do. So uh, you got to produce the numbers, right? So as an athlete, we just understood that part of the job is if you don't produce, you're out, you're out of the job. That's performance-based acceptance. I knew that I wasn't going to be accepted as part of the team if I hit 150, like I did in 2007, you know, I knew that. It's also very competitive, right? The, the, the performance-based acceptance because you're always looking and comparing yourself to the per people next to you going, am I as good as that person is, you know, there's always a comparison going on. And like sports, for example, is a zero sum game. If you win, I lose. If I win, you lose. That's a zero sum game. There's something we really love about that as humans, because at the end of the day, I can quantify how well I did because I won or I lost. I can, I can at least see it. In so many jobs, you don't get a chance to see it. And that's what's so frustrating is like you can work for, 
years and not know, am I really winning or not? That's why we love sports in a lot of ways, I think. But part of the problem with that is it's, there is a scarcity mindset involved in it. There's not enough for everybody to go around. So we've got to fight and claw to be the best and to, and, and to compete against the people. The other thing about performance mindset, performance-based acceptance is it's an outward in approach. We are, it's absolutely needed for the outward life. Like, oh, hey, we got to pay bills. You got you to have a roof over your head. You got to have clothes on the back. You got to have a car to drive. You got to have all these external things. So we, we tend to look at it like, it matters more than anything matters. But see, relationship 101 from God's perspective is totally different. He is not performance based in the way that he thinks of us. His, his is always qualitative. It's, it's quality of life. It's not the quantities that you own or don't own. Uh, as the great philosopher Michael Scott once said, there is a scenario such as win, win, win. For those of you that are Office fans, okay? I love The Office. If, you, if anybody, anybody that knows me well knows that. John knows it well. We, we quote Office episodes all the time. But there is such a scenario in God's economy of win, 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 that we can all win. The other thing is it is an inside-out approach. It's experienced in the inner life first, and eventually it flows into the outer life. That's the way God's economy works, and that's relationship 101 from God's perspective. So what I, what I have been learning and really trying to drill into me, because I lived in the sports world for so long, I'm learning now what it's like to love God with heart and soul and not just mind and strength. Both in baseball and I think as a man, uh, we, I understand that power and these platforms, they create impact and influence, right? So it's nice to have positions and roles, but if you don't know who you are outside of the role, like if I take the uniform off, if I, uh, you know, leave this room and I don't have a platform anymore, do I know who I am when nobody's watching? Do I know who I am when I take the uniform off? And that's, that's always a question we all have. Whenever you leave a role and you transition from one thing to the other, those of you that have retired from anything into something else, there is an identity crisis that takes place because for so long you've been doing that one thing and you know how to do that thing and you know how to view yourself in that thing and everybody else knows how to view you in that thing and then you leave that thing and you don't know exactly what you're your next move is. You don't know exactly who you are in the next roles. What are the roles that you're going to have? And that's where I've been. But let me tell you something that I feel like God has told me between the difference between real power and just raw power. Okay. Like here's a weight room analogy for those of you that lift weights for as an athlete, we did so much of that during our career. I know it doesn't show anymore. My, my buddy, John, likes to say he's more powerful than I am. You know, he's, he's stronger. Look, he's shaking his head. Yeah, I am, you know. But there's a difference between raw power and being able to move a lot of weight and what I say functional power is, real power. See, as I get older and hopefully at some point wiser, I may not be as strong to withstand as much raw weight, but I can withstand many more different kinds of weight. Think about that analogy in our lives. Yeah, you may, you may have had some years past, but you've had some experiences now that you understand certain things you didn't understand before. You have the ability to bear certain kinds of weight that maybe you didn't before because you've been through some things, some really hard things, and you got through it, and you're at this point. But you may be feeling like right now, I'm enduring a weight that I've never had before and I don't know what to do. And that's essentially what I was dealing with after the World Series, because I'm going, I'm done with baseball. I, I have more years on my career, but I, what, what other carrots do I have to pursue? What else do I have to go get in the baseball world? So in my mind, I was already less motivated in trying to figure out, well, what do I do next? And even though it may not have been showing in the moment, it, it caught up with me pretty quickly.
And I had to learn part of what helped me in that moment of enough, the word enough. God needed to teach me something. See, I, I needed to start being more transparent. But there's a difference between transparency and talking about what you're struggling with and transparent vulnerability. Because transparency, you can talk about what you're struggling with, but also not really risk anything. See, when you become vulnerable with somebody else and you start sharing your story and they can take that and potentially hurt you with it, that's when you know you're really being vulnerable. But it takes transparent vulnerability to actually start to find a healthier place to be when you're struggling. You have to be willing to open up your life. You have to be willing to take the walls down and be truly vulnerable and say, I don't have it all figured out. I don't know what I'm doing. I need something more in my life than I have right now. And as, as a man, as an athlete, that was really hard to, to, to get to that place. And God took me there. It doesn't matter whether I was on the mountaintop or whether I was dealing with a tragedy in my life. God will take you there. And he takes us there in different ways. We've all been there to a certain degree and we've tried to build up a wall and say, no, 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 I'm not gonna feel this and I don't need to, I don't need to, to open up to everybody. I don't need to look like I'm weak. But when I started recognizing my weakness and started recognizing how much I needed God and started coming to God every morning with arms open like, God, I don't know what to do. I can't get out of this myself. I can't stop feeling this way. I don't want these thoughts. He woke me up that morning with the word enough. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says this. He says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. See, some of you, your mind and strength looks real strong. And maybe you can even make it look like your emotions are doing well. But your soul is so weighted down so burdened, and you don't know what to do with that. Jesus is offering a way out, a healthy way out, the right way out. When he woke me up with that word enough, you know what I did? I naturally did. I was like, okay, God, I get it. Yeah, enough of this self-pity, Enough of the, the crying and whining about, oh, woe is me, you know, I, I won the World Series, you know, su such a terrible tragedy. All this, these requests. And he was like, no, stop with the beating yourself up over everything. What I want you to know is right now when you feel the weakest you've ever felt, I loved you enough to send my son to die for you. See, he doesn't need us to be a hero every day. Other people do. We got to show up. Your family needs you. Your friends need you. Your partners need you. But God just wants to care for you. We can be human with the Lord. We can, we can know that he, he's there for us and that, that, that we don't have to keep striving and pushing and, and going after more. And I knew when I finally felt that feeling of, wow, I don't have to be everything to everyone anymore. I can actually say no to things and I don't have to feel guilty about it. I can start doing some self-care, start caring for myself the way that I need to in order to be the best version of myself for my family and friends. That's a, that's a unique concept, right? Do some self-care, some internal work on yourself, and then you're better for the people around you. 
Like if you really need to serve people, how can you serve if you have nothing left of yourself? And that's, the, that's a hard lesson I had to learn in that moment. But that began my journey of getting really healthy internally. And that's really, that's really what we're all about. You know, champion forward, one of my best friends in the world, John, we're going to be out there talking about how we are trying to help young athletes, their parents and coaches, with some of the challenges of trying to be elite. And parents, you know, if you have kids that are in sports, you know how challenging it is for you, not just your kids. We can't just work with kids and not work with parents because, as you know, the sports cult, youth sports culture is a little bit challenging at times. We've all seen it. But we all, I, I'm going to ask parents to do their own work, just like I'm going to ask kids to do that internal work. I'm going to ask coaches to do their own work and not just put it on their team. We all have to individually be willing to do our own work. And right now, that's what this moment is about. God brought me here. Keith and the committee got me here. John Harrison has a connection with CBMC. It's all, it's all God is bringing this moment. And he brought you in this room for whatever reason. And he put this message on my heart for whatever reason to share with you. And I'm just a broken man speaking to others that I know are struggling too at times. So as we wrap up here, I just want to take this platform and say thank you to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as he has not just rescued me from, from my own struggles and sin, but rescued me from all the weight that this life brings at times, because it's real. It doesn't matter whether you're a World Series champion or whether you're just a regular person and nobody knows what you do in your job. We're all dealing with it. It's, it's a challenge. And everybody has those heroic things they're trying to do every day. And keep doing it. You know, I, I want people to like be the best version of themselves and be the hero for those around you. But also to recognize we have a Lord and Savior who is the champion of champions. There is no one like him. No one will ever win like he can win. And he truly provides us the win-win-win scenario if we're willing to accept it. If we, arms, o arms open, humble, come to God with our weight and say, I want you to carry this for me. That is true, real power, in my opinion. That's the difference between power that everybody notices and recognizes in the weight room, you're throwing weight around, and functional power. You want functional power and influence? He's the one to go to. So thank you so much for having me. And I'll be out back to, to greet some of you uh, as you leave. Thank you.